Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Are you ready, babe? Sheila asked as she, without waiting for me to reply, carefully lowered herself to tease me. God, I've missed this, she smiled down at me. But then just as she began to pick the pace up a little, in the back of my mind somewhere, I could hear a strange banging noise. Sheila's smile turned into a mocking laugh as the vision of her began to fade from my mind. I was almost fully awake now. The dream or nightmare as it always turned into was gone. I realized the noise was someone banging on my front door. Struggling out of bed I grabbed my robe and made my way towards the door of my flat. Mr. Sleeman, open up. It's the police. I heard a voice demanding as I got closer to the door. On opening the door I was confronted by four men, one of whom I recognized and two in police uniforms. Martin Sleeman, I'm Detective Sergeant Moon, the one in plain clothes that I didn't recognize said as he flashed his warrant card at me, can we come in? I'd like a word with you if I may. I'd seen enough warrant cards in my life to know it was genuine at first glance, but having grown up on what some folks would consider the wrong side of town, I asked for a better look at his card just to piss him off a little. Look, I didn't know what the wankers wanted, but I hadn't done anything that I needed to worry about. Okay, what is this all about? I asked as I switched the kettle on after I had led them into the kitchen. If you don't mind, I'll ask the questions, D.S. Moon replied. In that case, I won't answer any questions until my solicitor is present. Have you got something to hide, Mr. Sleeman? He demanded. Alarm bells started really going off in my head. To be honest, I'd known D.C. Douglas Collins, the other arsehole, for years. He knew my name was Marty to everyone. The Mr. Sleeman bit spelt trouble, big time. No, but I feel slightly outnumbered here. If you want to ask me questions, I want to know in what context you're asking them. It's not often that I get woken up at. I looked at the clock. Shit, it's five o'clock. What the hell's so important that you've got to wake me at this time of the bloody morning? I'm making inquiries concerning your wife's accident. What accident? Your wife was involved in an accident last night, and I would like to know where you were around 11 p.m. I was here alone as I am most evenings nowadays. Is my ex-wife badly hurt? She's in intensive care, but the doctors tell me that the prognosis is reasonable. Now would you be so kind as to tell me where we can find your Range Rover? Do you suspect I had something to do with my ex-wife's accident? Mrs. Sleeman and a Mr. Anthony Pride were walking down the Finchley Road at approximately 11 o'clock last evening. A Range Rover traveling quite fast mounted the pavement and drove straight at them. The car hit your ex-wife but missed Mr. Pride. He claims that it was a deliberate attempt to kill both of them. The Range Rover drove off without stopping. Now I would like to take a close look at your Range Rover, please. You'll have to wait a couple of hours yet. Bessie's in Roland's garage, having the gearbox replaced again. She's been in there all bloody week. D.S. Moon looked at the two uniformed officers, and they left. I assumed to go and visit Roland. Is there any way you can prove that you were here last night? Mr. Sleeman? That's a good one. How the hell am I expected to prove that I was alone in my flat? The definition of being alone means that I had no one here to vouch for me, doesn't it? Well, in that case, I'm going to ask you to come down to the station and help me with my inquiries. Sure, but you won't mind if I call my brief first and then get dressed, will you? I called my solicitor, who wasn't best pleased to be called at that time in the morning, and then I got dressed. As we left the flat, I just happened to notice Mrs. Cummings, our local nosy Parker, watching as we passed her kitchen window. Since her husband passed away some years ago, Mrs. Cummings had little else to do but watch the Cummings, pun intended, and goings of her neighbors. I turned to Doug Collins. If you have a word with the old witch in there, she will probably give you a detailed list of my movements all week. Nothing gets past her no matter what time of night. D.C. Collins and D.S. Moon exchanged glances. Then Collins walked back and knocked on the old girl's door. D.S. Moon and I continued down to their car. After sitting there for some time, D.C. Collins appeared out of the block of flats and Mooney went over to meet him. They had an animated conversation for a few moments then D.C. Collins came over to me. To be fair Doug Collins wasn't really a bad bloke. At school we'd got on quite well together. But I'm afraid we'd had a couple of run-ins with each other since he'd taken up his chosen profession. The old girl says there is no way you left your flat between 8 o'clock when you got home and 2 in the morning when she went to bed. 
Does the old girl stay up until all the neighbors are in bed? If I know, but she likes her bit of gossip. I suppose you got the story of her in number 22. The old witch reckons she's on the game whilst her old man is at sea. Yeah, I got chapter and verse on that one. Anyway, the Sarge reckons that what the old girl says puts you right out of the frame. Mind he's still going to take a bloody good look at your car. That's his prerogative, but he'll find all. Anyway, what hospital is Sheila in? I'd like to check up on her. The Royal. I'm afraid she's in a bad way, Marty. She's in the ICU. They are not sure if she will pull through or not. You realize we have to treat it as murder until we know for sure which way the cookie crumbles. And what with that last little debacle between you and Sheila, we had little option but to investigate your whereabouts. Don't worry. I understand you've got a job to do. Right now I'm going back up to have a shave, then I'm going down there. Marty, you're still hung up on that woman, aren't you? What do you think, Doug? You've known us long enough. But she dumped you for that slimy prick Tony Pride, didn't she? To be honest with you, Doug, I'm not sure what happened to start with. But you know me. Once I got out of my pram, I wouldn't listen to any explanations and blew my top. I thought she divorced you. She did, but she never had much choice. I was climbing the wall and threatening to kill her in pridey. I suppose that's what sent your DS chasing around here so quickly. Not really. It was pridey who pointed the finger at you. Look, I think we need to have a word off the books about all this later on, if you don't mind. I'll be in the plow about six-ish. I tend to eat there as soon as the kitchen opens. I'll try and make it there tonight. I'd better go now. The Sarge is getting impatient. He hasn't had his breakfast yet. Oh, what was his plan? Let me sweat it out in a cell while he had his breakfast? Not far off, but as you hadn't been charged, he'd probably left you waiting in an interview room for an hour or so. I watched the officers drive away and then went back up to my flat to call my brief and let him know he wouldn't be required at the Nick and then prepare myself for my visit to the hospital. Sheila and I had met in a bar about 12 years ago. The guy she'd been with was apparently one of those guys who, when they get a few pints down them, thought he was the king of the world and looked for a scrap. But he picked a fight with the wrong guy, someone quite small who, I suppose he thought, he could handle easily. He might have been half cut, but he wasn't that stupid. His trouble was, he picked on a guy whose brothers were in the other bar. It might have been very messy if the governor hadn't been quick off the mark in getting the police to turn up. Anyway, after her date was hauled off to the nick by the local constabulary, I, being the gentleman that I am, and with an eye for the off chance, offered Sheila the benefit of my protection and a lift home. Well, we never actually went straight home. We stopped in another pub for a quiet drink, to calm Sheila's nerves down a bit. From there we dated steadily for several months, until she went off to university. It was four years later, and I was playing best man at a friend's wedding. Who should turn up as a bridesmaid but Sheila? Now everyone knows that the best man is supposed to look after the bridesmaid. So, the next thing you know Sheila and I wake up in the morning in the same bed. Damn that. I had been too pissed to remember our first night together. Although I do remember rogering one of the other bridesmaids earlier in the evening, Sheila must have played hard to get to start with. I think she had expected me to wait for her whilst she had been in uni. But as I'd heard she was playing the field up there, I had no intention of being played for a fool. Anyway, let's cut to the chase. Sheila and I were married six months later when she was four months pregnant. I think we were very happy together. I'll say, I, because you can never really tell what other folks are thinking, can you? All you can ever be certain of are the feelings in your own heart. Unfortunately, we lost our little Kathy at three months. Caught death syndrome, they said. That's just a way of them saying we don't know why your baby died. The trouble with that one is, there are always folks who will make their own mind up about what happened and gossip behind your back. Sheila's cycle went a pot after little Kathy went. We tried really hard for the next few years, but Sheila just didn't fall pregnant again. The doctor put her on the pill to regulate her cycle, but that of course didn't do much for the baby-making plants. She could however hold down a job after she was on the pill, something she'd had a lot of trouble with over the years. PMT is only supposed to last for a couple of days. When Sheila's cycle was up the creek, hers could last for a couple of weeks at a time. Things were happier at home as well. With her cycle going haywire home life hadn't been too pleasant on occasions. Well, things settled down for about three years. Then the subject of children came up again. 
We figured that the pill could have sorted out Sheila's cycle problem and if she came off them, with luck things should return to what they should be. Best plans of mice and men. Yeah, Sheila's periods now came at regular intervals. But we still didn't get lucky in the child stakes. Still these things can take time. Then one afternoon I came home from work, and Sheila wasn't home yet. She was always home before me. I started getting dinner ready, well, I tried. But I'm not much cop at the old cooking lark. After wandering around the kitchen like a lost sheep for half an hour or so, I resorted to the old standby and called the local Chinese to have a takeaway delivered. By 7 o'clock the Chinese had arrived, but there was still no sign of Sheila. I've got to say by now I was getting very worried. After all, you read some strange stories in the newspapers nowadays. I called her office, but the security guard said they had all left hours ago. I started calling her friends from work. Luckily, we had one of those personal phone books by the phone and Sheila had written everybody's number in it. I couldn't get an answer from any of her workmates. So from that I assumed she must have stopped for a drink with them after work. But by now it was gone 9 o'clock. Well, it was half 11 when the taxi pulled up outside and a very noisy Sheila staggered out shouting goodnight to her friends. I took up a superior stance sitting in the kitchen awaiting her arrival. I think I should point out here that we tended to use the kitchen door as the main entrance. It's just the way that house was laid out when they converted it from a barn. That is nearest door to the road. Maybe I overdid the look of disdain I had on my face. I'm not sure. But when Sheila walked in the door, she took one look at me and then before I could really get into playing the annoyed husband bit, she just said, screw you. I've got a right to go out for a drink with my friends now and again. And then she turned. I assume with the intention of going through the door that led to the hall and the stairs to the bedroom. Unfortunately, Sheila opened the door to the basement instead and then promptly went arse over tip down the stairs. As quick as I tried to be, I wasn't able to get there in time when I saw Sheila turning the wrong way. Did I shout a warning to her? I really couldn't remember. I just saw her disappearing through the cellar door. The ambulance arrived surprisingly quickly and Sheila was hauled off to casualty. Luckily, Sheila hadn't broken any bones. The doc said that was most likely because she was drunk, something to do with the body being relaxed. But she had taken a nasty bump on the head and she was suffering from concussion, so they kept her in for observation. What I couldn't understand was her attitude to me that night. But then I didn't like what one of the docs said to me. He asked if Sheila and I were in the habit of taking recreational drugs. I told that there was no way either of us took any drugs. He just raised his eyebrows and went to turn away. Look, I've never been to hold my tongue. I asked him to elaborate on why he'd asked the question, but he wouldn't. The following day when I went to visit Sheila in the hospital quite late as I had been up most of the night, Detective Constable Douglas Collins was coming out of her room as I arrived. He just said hi to me and kept on walking past. When I asked Sheila what he was doing there, she said he was investigating her accident. But Sheila apparently had no recollection of the previous day at all. That evening after I arrived home, D.C. Collins came to call. I had to give him chapter and verse of the previous day's events. He took a good look around the kitchen and at the basement stairs. I had to show him where I had been sitting. I pointed out the security monitor that I had watched Sheila arrive home on. Then I found and played him the part of the video that showed Sheila arriving home so he could see and hear her, getting out of the taxi and staggering towards the house. Then after that he did what I thought was a strange thing. He asked me to go outside the door and shout. I never could understand the point of that, but it did give him a little time alone in the house. After he asked me to come back inside, he requested that I played the video of Sheila coming home again. Only this time he asked me to let it run on a little longer. I was surprised that you could not only hear me shouting to Sheila that it was the wrong door she was going through, but her scream as she fell as well. He left apparently satisfied that it had been an accident. He steadfastly refused to tell me why he thought it was anything else. It was the next day, when I visited Sheila in hospital, that I first clapped eyes on Tony Pride. As I walked along the corridor, several of her friends from work were coming away from her room. Later I was to find out that one of them was Tony Pride. When I entered her room, Sheila told me the doctor had told her she could go home, but she was to take things easy for a while. I helped her to dress and then drove her home. Of course I wanted to know why she had not contacted me to let me know she was going out with her friends. But she claimed she had no recollection of the day of the accident at all, so she couldn't tell me. 
The thing I was really upset about had been her attitude when she got home that night. I had never stopped her going out with her friends, the same as she didn't object when I went for a drink with the guys. But we always let each other know what was going on so that we wouldn't worry. For the next few months, things appeared to go on as normal, but I noticed that there was a greater distance than normal between us. Look, things had never been that normal. Sheila's strange PMT symptoms as I said went on longer than most folks did. Oh yeah, and her cycle was slowly getting all screwed up again. But this time, things were definitely different. Only I couldn't put my finger on what was causing the problem. Yeah, it would have been easy to blame the PMT, but I somehow wasn't convinced. Sheila was spending more evenings with her friends and was treating me in a very strange way. Don't ask, I can't explain it really. But she showed a keen interest in exactly whom I was drinking with when I was out with the boys and where we went. A couple of times, she would show up at the pub with one of her mates. With hindsight, I should have suspected something, but as her friend Amy, whom she normally brought along, was sweet on one of my pals, I took no notice. I just assumed it was the old matchmaker thing. Then it must have been eight months after Sheila's accident. I came out of work one evening to be met by D.C. Collins and a couple of other officers. They asked me to accompany them to the station to help them with their inquiries. They told me that if I refused, they would arrest me. At the Nick, a detective inspector who I didn't know, questioned me about Sheila's accident on the basement stairs again. Four hours, he went over the events that evening again and again. After 16 hours of questioning, they suddenly told me that I could go home. When I got home, I was totally shocked to find that Sheila had moved out of the house. No note of explanation or anything. I tried to call her on her mobile phone. We had joined the yuppie mobile phone set after our last debacle, which meant we could get in touch with each other wherever we were. But her phone was switched off. The following day, I was standing up the road from her office when Sheila finished work. She came out with one of her colleagues. I began walking towards her to ask her what the hell was going on. But as I got close, Tony Pride appeared and put his arm around her. Now I could see that Pridey had seen me coming, but I'm positive that Sheila and her friend had no idea I was there. Sheila made a move to push his arm away, that I noticed, but it didn't register in my mind at the time. I was angry and not really thinking straight. Sheila, I need to talk to you. I said as I got close enough. She has nothing to talk to you about, Pride said, as he stepped between us. Get lost, a-hole. I'm talking to my wife. What happened next was more of a farce than anything else. Pridey took up the classic boxer stance and started skipping about like he was Cassius Clay or something. I'm warning you. I'm an amateur boxer. He announced. Screw me. I'm really scared. No, Tony, stay out of this. He'll kill you, Sheila said, apparently in an attempt to get Pridey to back off. But Pridey was having none of it and moved in close. I assume he was planning on putting me down. He aimed a left jab at my face probably planning to follow that with a cross, as I noticed his right arm going back. Unfortunately for him, his left fist found my hand waiting for it. Grabbing his fist, I gave it a twist to the left, and he was forced to turn with it. We all heard something go as I kicked him in the side of his left leg, just bellow the knee, and he collapsed in a heap. You scumsucker! Sheila shouted at me as she knelt down beside the not-so-proud Pridey who was rolling on the floor in pain. Well, he asked for it. And you had to be the big man and break his bloody knee? What the hell was I supposed to do? Let him hit me. You shouldn't be here. I don't want to see you anymore, and I certainly don't want to be married to a man who tried to kill me. What the hell are you talking about? I've never done anything to harm you. Oh, yeah? Well, I've had therapy, and it's helped me remember what happened the night you threw me down the stairs. The conversation stopped at that point as two police officers grabbed hold of me from behind. I hadn't heard them arrive. They handcuffed me and pushed me into the back of a meat wagon. At the Nick, I was charged with assault and battery and then shoved into a cell. You might get the idea now, why policemen aren't my favorite people. Anyway, I called the local criminal solicitor. He'd represented a few acquaintances of mine in the past. It didn't take him long to get me out. Unfortunately for Pridey, security cameras covered the street outside Sheila's offices. Foolishly, I didn't press charges for assault against him. The video, although it had no sound, definitely showed him attacking me. After that, I tried a couple of times to talk some sense into Sheila, but to no avail.
Things really came to a head when a few of the boys and myself went to a restaurant for a meal one evening. We'd been there for some time when who should I spy walking in but Sheila and her best mate Amy, followed by Pridey and some other guy. Pridey was still limping a little, and he was using a walking stick. They didn't notice us sitting in our corner when they sat down for their meal. Pridey sitting opposite Sheila. There was nothing lovey-dovey about the way they behaved towards each other, but I was really pissed off at seeing them together. The boys managed to keep me under control as we finished our meal rather hurriedly. The plan was for us to leave quietly, but Pridey couldn't keep his bloody mouth shut when he saw me. As loud as he could, he said, Right now, Sheila my love, what would you like for your sweet? It was so loud it was obvious that it was meant for my ears. I changed direction so that I would walk past their table. The expression on Pridey's face changed from belligerence to a look of apprehension. When I got to the table I stopped and leaning down so I wouldn't have to speak too loudly myself, I told them, if either of you try to embarrass me in public again, I'll not be held responsible for my actions. Now, Sheila, if you want to set up home with this arsehole, apply for a divorce like any civilized person and don't try to think up lies to get me put in prison. I didn't. Marty, this is not what it looks like. I was just... I didn't hear any more as I had walked out of earshot. As we got into the car outside, one of my friends told me that Sheila's friend Amy had followed us out and was standing on the pavement calling my name. I just told the guy driving to drive on. A few weeks later my solicitor informed me he had heard from Sheila's legal people. Divorce went through in a few months. Our lovely house was sold and our assets divided equally. As there were no children and apparently Sheila was getting married again, there was no alimony to discuss. Well, she didn't ask for any. So that brings us to where we were just over a year after the divorce. Sheila was in hospital again, and the police suspected that I was involved in some way. When I got to the hospital, I was surprised to find that Sheila was registered as Sleeman. I had thought she would have married the prick by now. After I had identified myself to a nurse, she showed me into a room and asked me to wait for the doctor. Mr. Sleeman? The doctor asked as he entered the room. That's me. So sorry I am confused. There was a man here earlier who said he was Mrs. Sleeman's fiancé. He could well be. I haven't seen Sheila for over a year now. I'm her ex-husband. But you remember the vows, in sickness and in health, for better for worse and all that crap. Just because we're divorced, it doesn't mean that I'm not concerned about her. Um, this is a bit unusual, but besides her fiancé, there doesn't appear to be anyone else, no other relatives. That's correct. As far as I'm aware, Sheila has no other relatives. She was orphaned some years ago before I met her. I'm not sure how we go on this one, but it can't do any harm to tell you. And we'll need someone to help us with the release forms. Her fiancé tells us she's a Jehovah's Witness. But really we need to operate on her. The sooner the better. Her fiancé says she wouldn't agree to invasive surgery, but without it she's going to die. Jehovah's Witness. What the hell are you talking about? Sheila isn't religious, and she couldn't have changed that much. No, hang on a minute, I know she isn't. I saw a friend of hers the other week, and I'm sure she would have told me if Sheila had suddenly got religion. Give me a minute, and I'll check with Sheila's best friend Amy. I'm surprised she isn't here anyway. I got out my mobile phone to call Amy. She would know if this Jehovah's Witness lark were true or not. But the doctor stopped me and told me to turn my phone off and use a landline. Then I called Sheila's office. Amy was shocked to hear that Sheila had been in an accident. I asked her why Tony Pride hadn't told everyone at the office about it, and she informed me that Tony didn't work there anymore. When I mentioned the Jehovah's Witness lark, Amy was shocked and said there was no way that was true. I told the doc who was still standing there waiting, and he asked me if I could get Amy to the local magistrate's court in a hurry. Then the doctor and I set out for the court ourselves, but in a police car. Amy arrived just as we did. We were ushered into an office where we found Tony Pride and a guy who I took to be a solicitor. They were apparently trying to convince a judge to issue an order that no invasive surgery was to be carried out on Sheila. It was apparent that the judge did not like the idea. Once Amy and I had had our say, he gave the doctor authority to do what he thought was in the patient's best interests until she was able to make those decisions for herself. The doctor immediately called the hospital and Sheila was in the theater by the time we arrived back there. Strangely, when we came out of the courthouse, Tony Pride was nowhere to be found. I was sitting in the waiting room when Doug Collins arrived. 
I see you never made it to the pub. I guessed you'd still be here. Christ, what's the bloody time? I asked. 7.30. Bugger. Where's the bloody phone? Amy said as she rushed out of the room. I assumed to call someone and put off a date. How is she? Colin asked. Still in the theater. She's been down there for hours. Damn, I hope she makes it for your sake. Thanks, Doug. Now what did you want to talk about? Well, you know what they say about a coppa's nose. It was something that the old girl said to me this morning. I'm pretty sure someone was trying to set you up for a fall last night. That nosy neighbor of yours spotted a Range Rover, just like yours come into the car park by your flat a couple of times last night. It was in there twice, once about half ten and then again about half eleven, and the second time it turned up it only had one headlight working. I get the feeling whoever was driving it was playing dirty. If it happened to pass any video cameras en route to the accident, it would show up at the right time on the right cameras going both ways. I suspect they expected your car to be parked in the car park, and they would have most likely smashed your headlight to match the damage on the Range Rover that hit Sheila. But why? Hang on, I haven't finished. You remember when Sheila fell down the stairs the other year? I came around and had a word with you. Well, we were acting on an anonymous tip-off. I'll give you one guess where that tip-off came from. I must have looked confused. The call box in the foyer of Sheila's office building. We know it was a guy because it was recorded. And guess what time it was made? Just after half a dozen of them had returned from visiting Sheila here. I think she told them she couldn't remember what had happened the day before, and one of them decided to get up to some mischief. Well, since that day I've had a good idea who, but I haven't been able to figure out the why. Of course you knocking him about didn't help any. You think Pridey said about driving Sheila and me apart. I'm bloody sure he did. What better way to separate a couple than to get her to believe her husband tried to kill her? Amy returned at this point. Well, I suppose he wanted Sheila divorced and single so he could marry her. He might want to marry Sheila. But she doesn't want to marry him, Amy said with an uncharacteristic tone to her voice. But they're engaged, I said. According to him, but not according to her. She goes out with him socially, but that's all. I don't think they have even kissed each other, let alone anything else. He's asked her to marry him on more than one occasion, but she's got a problem about accepting. He tells everybody that they are engaged, but sometimes Sheila has had a real go at him over it. I don't understand. What's her problem? You. You lughead. She's in love with you. Talk sense. Amy. Sheila divorced me, remember? Yes, because she likes living. Sheila has been in a real mess for the last year or so. Ever since you started playing around with that girl. Sheila knew you wanted to get her out of the way so you could marry the mother of your children. What the hell are you talking about now? I haven't been playing around with anybody, and I certainly haven't got any little scumsuckers out there. Well, that's what Sheila believes, because someone put the idea into her head that you've got a girlfriend somewhere, and she's convinced you tried to kill her. I know she's been very confused that you haven't moved in with the girl. Amy's right. You know, Marty, Doug added. And I think it's Tony Pride who's been putting these ideas into Sheila's head. I'm pretty sure it was Tony Pride who accused you of throwing her down those stairs. It was Tony Pride who attacked you outside the office that night, and it was Tony Pride who claimed it was you driving that Range Rover last night. But what's the guy up to? Assuming that it was him who organized that so called accident last night, what the hell is his motive for trying to kill her? Surely it couldn't be because she wouldn't marry him. I know. It doesn't make any sense. But that's what we've got to find out. Find the motive, and you've normally got the crime solved. Whatever, with all that farce about Sheila being a Jehovah's Witness, he certainly showed his hand. It looks to me that he wants Sheila dead for some reason, Doug said. Let's start at the beginning. 1. He or someone plants the idea in Sheila's head that you've got a bit on the side. They added some children to make it look like a long-term affair. 2. Someone convinces Sheila that her falling down the stairs when she was drunk wasn't an accident. Oh, by the way, you do know that Sheila didn't have enough alcohol in her blood that night to be done for drunk driving. That's rubbish. She could hardly stand up. Well, that isn't what the blood tests they took here showed. The trouble is they left it too late to find out what else could have been in her blood that night. The doc thought she had taken what he termed a recreational drug, but that could mean anything. What? You think that Pridey drugged her? Do you think he was after getting her into bed that night? I asked. No, 
It wasn't Tony who had those kinds of ideas, Amy interjected. It was some friend of his. Look, we all went to the pub for a drink that night to celebrate one of the other girl's birthday. Around seven some of us went up the road to get something to eat. Sheila didn't come with us. She said she was going home when she had finished her drink. Anyway, when we got back to the pub about nine, Sheila was out on the floor dancing. Honestly, she was off her head. I'd never seen her dancing like that before. It was like she couldn't stop. Just after eleven, the drink seemed to hit her, and she virtually collapsed. This Bob, or whoever he was said he would take her home. Oh, yeah, and you can see us letting that happen when Sheila was as drunk as a skunk. The girls and I insisted that she come in our taxi with us. This Bob guy wasn't too pleased about that, but we were adamant and then Tony stepped in and told him to leave it. Hmm, let's make that three. What would have been your reaction if Sheila had woken up in someone else's bed in the morning, Marty? Don't tell me. I can guess. That plan didn't work. So when our friend finds out Sheila's had an accident and can't remember what happened, he points the finger at you. But Sheila did remember. That shrink guy she went to. He was a doctor who hypnotized her, and she remembered. Amy exclaimed. Oh, yeah. I got the report on those allegations, Doug said. Look, I was in that kitchen the following day. Nothing Sheila said fitted correctly. If there had been the fight that Sheila claimed they had, look, there just wasn't the room. Unless half the furniture had been smashed and it wasn't. And that door to the cellar, it opens outwards. How the hell could Marty have pushed her through it? Remember there were no marks, no damage, nothing. Plus the security camera is just outside the back door. The microphone would have picked up any shouting or screaming. All it picked up was Marty shouting a warning to Sheila and her scream as she fell. No, I'm damn sure Sheila opened the door herself and walked through it thinking it was the door to the hall. Have you ever heard of planted memories, Amy? Well, that's what I suspect was somehow done to Sheila, by that quack or whatever he was who hypnotized her. Her story was inconsistent with the facts, as I know them. Have you any idea who this therapist was she want to see? Someone that Tony knew, I think, Amy replied. You see, Tony pried again. But just what was the bugger up to? Doug asked looking at me. Well. I'm buggered if I know. If he wanted to steal my wife, why the hell would he try to kill her? Maybe we are looking at this wrong. Supposing Tony Pride wanted Sheila dead all the time, Doug suggested. But why would he want to separate her from me first? I asked. That's what we've go to work out, Marty. Doug sat back in his chair, obviously thinking. Amy, who had been looking very thoughtful, suddenly asked, Marty, could Sheila have had any relatives with money? Not that I know of. Why? Look, I'm speculating here. But what if Sheila was going to inherit a lot of money from some relative you didn't know existed? You know a long-lost aunt or something. Look, this is all a bit Agatha Christie. I know, but I like her books. Now let's just imagine for a minute that Tony Pride is also related to this unknown benefactor. But a little further removed, so if Sheila dies, he would inherit. Now if Sheila was to die whilst she was married to you, even though she didn't know she had inherited the money, it would go to you as her husband. But if you were divorced first before she inherited, it wouldn't go to you. It would go to the next nearest relative in line. And I'll bet I can guess who that is going to turn out to be. But why the attempted frame on me for the accident last night? Because you can't legally benefit from a crime in this country, even if you could prove that whoever it was the money is coming from died and left it to Sheila before you were divorced. If you had killed her, you couldn't inherit the money anyway. We both sat there looking at Doug now. Far-fetched, I'll give you. But it certainly fits the scenario. I'm going back to the Nick to see what I can dig up on our Mr. Anthony Pride and while I'm at it, Marty, give me Sheila's maiden name and do you know where she was born? Smith, her maiden name was Sheila Smith. But I haven't got the faintest idea where she was born. She never has been very forthcoming about her childhood. All I can really tell you is that she's an orphan. But her birth certificate must be somewhere. I'll need to find it if I can. I think there must a copy in the files at home. I don't remember her taking it with her. I'll have a look and dig it out later. Right. If you don't hear from me first, call me on my mobile. Here's the number, Doug said. He gave me a card and then left the room. Amy and I sat alone together for another hour before one of the doctors came in to see us. The operation was over. Sheila had a fractured skull and there had been a lot of bleeding into her brain. 
We gathered they had had some difficulty stopping the bleeding. I wouldn't say the doctor was pessimistic, but he was annoyed that Tony Pride had delayed the operation with all the crap about Sheila being a Jehovah's Witness. With the way litigation goes nowadays, they needed to get the permission of a judge before they could proceed once they had been told that. He said the prognosis was fair but not good. They would keep Sheila sedated for the next few days while they waited for some swelling of her brain to go down. Amy and I went in to see her, but all we could see were bandages and tubes going everywhere. You know, you've all seen those machines beeping away on the telly. The doctors told us Sheila had numerous broken bones, but it was the injuries to her head that they were worried about. Amy and I left the hospital together, and we went for a meal at a nearby fish and chip shop. I dropped Amy home, and she asked me to pick her up and take her back to the hospital in the morning. She had no intention of returning to work until she knew Sheila was all right. At home, I searched our files for Sheila's birth certificate but couldn't find it. Then it struck me. None of our papers were there. No marriage license or decree nisi, and Sheila's old passport was gone. I'd given her current one to her solicitor when he had asked for it. But I was sure he hadn't asked for her other papers. Yes, I had been playing silly buggers at the time of the divorce. If Sheila didn't ask, she didn't get. Well, when you're playing a losing hand, any small victory makes you feel a little bit better. I didn't sleep well that night. Shit, I don't think I slept at all. Amy and I were back at the hospital at 8 o'clock, but there was no change in Sheila's condition. Tony Pride hadn't showed up again either. I rang my office and told them I wouldn't be in again for some time. They didn't object, which is the advantage of being good at your job. They didn't want to lose me. Doug Collins turned up again about half ten. I noticed D.S. Moon came with him this time, but he stayed well away from me, except when he came over to ask me how Sheila was. He'd already spoken to the doctor, so I think he was trying to build a bridge. Doug said that they couldn't find Tony Pride. Well, not the Tony Pride that we all knew. Whoever he was, he had stolen the identity of someone else. The Tony Pride that his paperwork referred to was living in Australia. The address he had been using was a rented room in a house. Apparently, they only ever saw him about once a week when he collected his mail. Everything that was known about him was false. Two weeks passed with Amy and I sitting by Sheila's bed all day every day. Then one morning Doug Collins came in and told us he'd managed to trace Sheila's now dead great uncle. Apparently the guy had several million pounds that Sheila would inherit. It turned out she had been orphaned much younger than I had thought. She had been adopted and her new parents had changed her surname. Doug had been to see them and they told him she had not taken being told she was adopted very well. A rift had formed between them and she had effectively run away. They hadn't seen or heard from her since she was 18. They turned up at the hospital one day, but they didn't stay very long. It must have been upsetting for them to see her in that condition. I told them I would let them know when she regained consciousness. They thanked me and said they would return then. One of the nurses told me they called three times a day after that for progress reports. For weeks after the accident, things had changed a little. Some of the bandages had gone but we still sat there listening to the monotonous beep of the heart monitor. One of the machines that were recording Sheila's brain activity had been showing signs that made the medical staff optimistic, but they meant little to us. Amy and I had both returned to work by then. We had a rota going. I sat with Sheila one day, Amy the next, and one of the other girls from Sheila's office took the third day. Then it was my turn again. Both Amy and I visited every evening and ate together afterwards. We had our own table at the fish and chip shop by then, and a sign on the wall had appeared saying, no change. Other customers and the staff had overheard Amy and my conversations, and they had become involved in Sheila's plight. We did all we were supposed to do. Played music that Sheila liked, talked to her about everything and anything. I discovered Doug Collins was calling in after he finished late shift to read Wuthering Heights, Sheila's favorite book, to her. He'd spotted her well-thumbed copy on her bedside table when he was searching her flat for her documents. We never did discover when they were taken from my flat or by whom, but we never found any of them. I thought I was talking to Sheila one morning, but I must have been a little more tired than I realized. I suddenly heard a croaky voice quietly say, Hello, Marty. Are you awake now? I'm not quite sure what I did then. I know that the table beside me with cup and saucer on it went for six and that noise brought the nurses running. I must have said something to Sheila, but I have no idea what. The next thing I remember is being ushered out of the room when the doctors arrived. 
Then I started on a round of phone calls that led to folks arriving in droves. Only they were not let into Sheila's room. After some time, a nurse called Amy and I out of the waiting room where everyone had congregated. She told us we could go and see Sheila again. When we got to the door I stopped and let Amy go first. She walked over to the bed. I saw Sheila smile at her and they started talking to each other. I took that as my cue to leave. I'd done my duty and stayed with Sheila whilst she was at death's door. Now my duty done, it was time to get on with my life. I stopped into the fish and chip shop to give them the news and watched as they put up a sign saying, she's awake. Then I went home to pack. The last month or so had been a strain on me. Christ, the last few years had been a bloody strain. I wanted to be somewhere else for a while. I must say my boss wasn't too impressed when I told him I was off to Spain for a couple of weeks, but he didn't argue. I'd been at my friend's villa for a week when Amy showed up. Curious as to why she was there I watched her get out of the taxi. The way she walked up to the swimming pool where I was sitting let me know she was not in a good mood. Just what the hell do you think you're playing, Martin Sleeman? She demanded when she got close enough for me to hear. What's your problem? Aren't I allowed to take a holiday? No, not when your wife needs you, you aren't. Hang on, Amy, you're forgetting Sheila isn't my wife anymore. She divorced me, remember? She decided she didn't need me anymore. Well, why did you sit beside her bed for five weeks while she was unconscious then? Duty, nothing more. In sickness and health until the Lord put asunder and all that shit. Don't give me that crap. You love her. Immaterial, Amy, Sheila divorced me. What I feel for her is unimportant. Marty, she loves you. I don't believe that for one minute. Remember what she did to me. That wasn't love. No, it was a mixed up girl who needed help. Well, she chose someone else to give her that help. Now she's rich enough she'll have plenty of guys willing to help her. Don't you worry. That's the point. I am worried. Look, she loves you and needs you. What for? Her to shout at. To call a murderer or to knock her boyfriends around when they get stroppy and give her an excuse to call me a scumsucker? Christ, you are pissed off with Sheila aren't you? I am. I love her, but the year we were apart up until she had that accident. I think I was happier than I'd been in the previous six years. I can't say I was happy to be without her, but I wasn't walking on eggshells every day because I didn't know what kind of mood she was going to get out of bed in. But, Marty, Sheila was suffering from, oh, yeah, PMT, PMS, or whatever shit you want to call it. But remember she accused me of trying to murder her. I don't need all that kind of shit in my life. No, it wasn't PMT. Oh, the psychiatrists think that the hormone thing made it worse, but they are sure Sheila was probably been suffering from clinical depression ever since little Kathy died. And you know Sheila's memory of you trying to kill her was implanted while she was hypnotized. Bollocks. Amy. PMT. PMS or clinical depression. What the hell am I supposed to be? A psychiatric nurse or something? And I'll never believe you can make anyone do something they don't really want to do by hypnotizing them. But Sheila recalls that evening in detail now. She says that it was like looking at what was happening and not having any control over it. She says she remembers swearing at you, and she even knew she was opening the wrong door. She says she just couldn't stop what was happening. I don't give a damn anymore. Look, I did my bit. I was there when she needed me. Now I'm going to live my own life and forget about Sheila. Oh, I've wasted my time coming here then. You sure have. Amy never said goodbye. She just turned around and walked slowly back to her taxi. She stopped and looked back at me one more time before she got into the taxi, then it drove away. I'd been back from my holiday a couple of weeks when Doug Collins called round on the Saturday morning. He found me in the throes of packing up everything as I was moving to a small house over the other side of town. He told me that they hadn't been able to track the alias Tony Pride character down. They were pretty sure they knew who he was. Apparently they believed he was a great nephew of Sheila's benefactor. But as he was illegitimate, that had put him out of the running for the money. Unless there were no other living relatives. Doug asked me why I hadn't gone to see Sheila since I'd been back and, well, we had the same kind of argument that I'd had with Amy. I won't go into that one. About six months later my solicitor asked me to call on him. He presented me with a check for nearly five million pounds. Apparently it was my half of Sheila's inheritance. We'd mutually agreed to split our assets down the middle when we divorced. 
As her great uncle had actually died before we were divorced, Sheila had sent half the money on to me. With due ceremony, I tore the check into pieces and asked my solicitor to send it back. We went through that same pantomime at least five times before the check stopped arriving. The next thing that hit me was the inland revenue. They sent me a demand for tax on the five million quid. It took a lot of persuading to convince them that I had not accepted the money. One of the tax inspectors actually said to me, Are you nuts? I was when I married her, but I'm not anymore, I told him in reply. I think he was the one who finally accepted the fact that I was not going to take the money. During the next year, I changed my job. Well, I was headhunted by another company. There I made a fresh start and started dating some of the girls in the office. Nothing serious. Once bitten twice shy and all that crap. One of the girls I went out with was a member of the local country club and she introduced me to golf. Hey, it was more exercise than I'd had in years. I wasn't much cop at it, but I enjoyed myself playing. So I joined the country club myself. Generally, I tended to play on my own. Not being very good, I wouldn't show myself up too much that way. There are three courses so by making an early start in the summer. Normally, I was on my own on the course most of the time, with no one chasing up behind me. One morning, I was by the fifth green, hunting for at least one of the balls I'd managed to knock into the woods that day. After looking around for a while and locating two balls that weren't mine, I was just coming out of the small thicket but on the wrong side over by the sixth tee when someone on the sixth must have sliced a ball that made a hole in one, right on my nose. I was stunned for a couple of minutes and found myself sitting on the ground nursing my nose when the culprit came over apologizing profusely. Hasn't anyone ever told you to shout for before you tee off? I demanded in anger. I couldn't see a bloody thing as both my eyes were watering so much. I'm sorry, Marty. I didn't realize you were so close. Shit. I knew that voice, but for a minute I couldn't or didn't want to place it. Who are you? I can't see, I demanded. Don't you know? The voice asked. Shit. I did know, but I didn't want to know. I can't see. Point me in the direction of the clubhouse, I said as I got to my feet. What about your stuff? I'll walk back with you and carry your clubs for you. No, don't bother. I'll get one of the caddies to collect them for me. Marty, I can't let you go off like this. I'm coming with you. No, leave me alone. Haven't you messed up my life enough? Marty, I've never meant to treat you so badly. I didn't realize how badly I'd behave towards you until Amy told me when she came back from Spain. That's over now, Sheila. Just stay out of my life in the future will you? No, I'm not going to do that, Marty. I love you and I believe you love me. Well, you might not love me at this particular minute, as I've just hit you with a golf ball. But I know I can make you love me again. Huh. I had planned that you would catch me up out here. I'm sorry I hit you. What's it going to take, woman, to convince you to stay away from me? Well, I'd suggest you start by trying to get a court order. But as I've got enough cash to fight you on that, all the way to the European court, I think you'll be wasting your time on that one. Look, the sensible thing is for me to take you to the clubhouse and then to hospital if need be. We can talk about everything else later. Well, I'm having that damn dream again. There she is, like always, bouncing up and down on me. But hang on, what's that bloody noise? Shit, the babies are crying. Don't worry about that, the nanny will see to them. That's what she's paid for, Sheila smiled down at me. Life goes on. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.